God, I do thank you for those who have gathered this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to preach. Um, Lord, I pray that you would take everything in my heart that would distract me, entangle me, whatever. Uh, Lord, I pray that you take this message that, um, that I've prepared by your grace and that you would just um, solidify it in my heart, that you'd, um, uh, yeah, just internalize it, work it out in my life even as I preach it, but also just, just help me to have the words. And God, I pray that your spirit would provide what is lacking and that would apply these words to, to these lives. Amen. So this morning we're jumping back into a series in the middle of Matthew called Coming Before the King. And in this series we see all sorts of people coming to Jesus with all sorts of questions and problems and requests and petitions. Uh, This morning the question that that we're going to see, it gets to the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Of what it means to follow Jesus. Because from the earliest days of his ministry on earth, that is what Jesus has been calling us to do. We read through the, the opening pages of several of the Gospels, and, and one of the first things that we run into is, is these four teenage boys that are, that, are, that are sitting on the beach because they're fishermen. And, and as the scenes open, they're on the beach, they're with their nets, it's, it's, it's an evening job, it's, a, it's, it's an all-nighter kind of job. They fished in the evening there, and then in the morning, they're, they're on the beach and they're cleaning their nets, they're preparing their nets, they're, they're, they're folding them, they're getting them ready for tomorrow so that they can do their job. Fishing was their life. But Jesus, he, 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 he steps into their lives and he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He says, I've been preparing you, even in your vocational skills, in your passions, in your hobbies, whatever. I, I've been steering you. I've been guiding you. I've had a purpose for you. And now it's time for you to give up all that other stuff and come and follow me. And that's exactly what they did. What we see in the Gospels is that these men, they, they literally left their nets and followed Jesus. They literally left everything and followed Jesus. And from that moment on, nothing defined their lives so much as following Jesus. From that moment on, they walked with Jesus and they talked with Jesus. They ate and they drank and they slept under the stars with Jesus. They listened and learned. Uh, they, they watch Jesus love and serve and teach and preach and heal and restore. And then as his ministry carried on, they were, they were swept up in it. And they were invited to do the same. For three years of their life, as they followed Jesus around the countryside, they were, they were following Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. In order that they might love as he loves and serve as he serves and, and, and do what he does. They were his disciples. And that's what disciples do. That's what disciples are. They're people who follow Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. And in a certain sense, it's no different with us. That's what we mean when we talk about being a disciple, that we follow Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. And yet Jesus is not physically, bodily walking in front of us. So our following of Jesus is going to look something different than the disciples. And that's really what I want to get at this morning. What what does it look like for us? What does it mean for us to follow Jesus? What does it mean for us to follow him for the purpose of becoming like him? When When he comes to us and he says, come follow me, what will that mean for us? What will that cost us? How will we know if we're actually following Jesus or if we're just out going for a walk? These are the sorts of questions we're wrestling with this morning. As we look at the story that's, that's often been labeled the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, this story comes up in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're looking at it in Matthew this morning, chapter 19, verses 16 to 26. Before I dive in, though, I want us to get the context, because last week we, we kind of broke series, and so we need to go back two weeks ago, and, and what John ended with two weeks ago is, is really the setup for this passage. A couple of weeks ago, John's message closed uh, with, with people bringing children to Jesus. They, they were bringing the children, and the idea is these, you know, these parents, these loved ones, the older siblings, whatever, they wanted to bring these babies, these little children to Jesus, that Jesus might pray for them, that Jesus might bless them. So it's this kind of hallmark-type type moment. And, 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 and just like you know, some of us, we get around this time, and it's like all the Christmas movies, the hallmark stuff, we're just like done with it. The disciples were done with it. They're like, this, this is a distraction. This is an annoyance. Get the kids out of here. We've got work to do. 
Okay, we're preaching, we're teaching, we're healing, and the kids are in the way. To the disciples, the kids were a nuisance, they were a distraction, but what does Jesus say? Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Let me read just verse 14 again. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That's the setup. That's the immediate context. That's the backdrop of the humble faith of a child that's going to provide a sharp contrast to everything that follows with this rich young ruler. Okay? Verse 16 is where our passage opens, continuing right, right after what I just read to you. It begins, now a man came up to Jesus. And, and Matthew, he's not super descriptive in the beginning of the passage. We get more details as they come. But, but also, I told you, this story is retold in each of the first three Gospels. And in each of the Gospels, we get different nuances, different details, different, different perspectives, different angles on who this guy is. So I want to front load that just a little bit. I want to share what we learn about him. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, we, we see not that this man came to Jesus, but that he runs up to Jesus. And, and that's consistent. So we, we see eagerness there, but, but we also see youthfulness there. And it's consistent because later in Matthew's story, later in the other stories, it refers to him as a young man. Um, despite being relatively young, in Luke's account, he's referred to as a ruler. And, and what that probably means, it's probably a religious title. It probably means that he's a ruler of a synagogue, kind of like they're the Jewish, ancient, pre-Jesus equivalent of the local church. Okay, so, so probably this guy, he's, he's something like a pastor of his day, or some people think, yeah, he's probably a ruler in a little bit more significant sense than that. Maybe he's a part of the Sanhedrin. Um, Sanhedrin was kind of the, um, the Jewish reli- re- religious, I can't talk today, I'm telling you. It was, it was the Jewish religious equivalent of Congress. So, so take that for what you may. It sounds like a bad analogy. It sounds like a bad reference. It probably is. Um, it, it was the group of people who got together, and, and they had a lot of power, and they fought about things, okay? Um, either way, he, he's got some power. He's got some influence. He's some sort of a spiritual leader. Either way, he's, he's the sort of man who, who had influence and commanded respect, Likewise, by the end of the story and all of the stories, one of the, one of the tales that gets highlighted the most is that this man was very, very, very rich. He had money. He had power. Wealth alone in that culture, it would have been interpreted as blessing and favor from God. So we know that he's wealthy. We know that he's powerful. We know that, that he's religious, that he's moral, that he's well-educated, and that he's still very young, and yet he's accomplished all of these things. Verse 16 again, now now this man, this rich, young ruler, as he's often called, he came to Jesus and he asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What good thing must I do to get eternal life? How can I be saved? How can I be reconciled to God? How can I know beyond all knowing that I am right with God? In some ways, it's a really good question. And yet, at the same time, we immediately see a contrast between this man and the children who have come right before him. The children simply come. They come as children. They come with joy. They come with laughter. They come with faith. They they come with boldness. Children don't ask permission. You get to a certain age and you've trained them right and you've slapped their hand enough, they, they might ask permission, but little children don't come that way. Children presume. Ch- children trust that there's going to be grace. They're going to jump and somebody's going to catch them. They, they're going to interrupt and people are going to laugh and think it's funny and think it's cute and, and, and just welcome them in. That's what children do. The, these, these children, they don't come calculating. They don't come, you know, kind of, kind of bring in their resume. Hey, I did really good. I, I, I did things that ought to be pleasing to you, God. Now I can come into your presence. Now you'll probably accept me because I'm really impressive. Children don't do that. Children just come. They, they run. They jump. They play. 
<laughs> they, they have faith, they believe in grace, they trust in grace, they're, they're full of joy. Not this man. Now, this man's sincere. This man's eager. Likewise, this guy, he's, he's running into the presence of Jesus, but he's running with his resume in hand. Say, Jesus, look at all that I've accomplished. What more do I need to do? Because the, the children, they're coming by grace. This guy's coming by merit. The children are coming in humility. This guy's coming in pride. He's saying, I've accomplished all these things. What more do I need to do? Because, because I believe that there's a way that God's favor can be earned. And if anybody can do it, I'm the sort of guy who's going to do it. Just, just pave the way. Paint the picture. Tell me which way to turn, and I'm going to turn. Tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. This man believed that his salvation could be earned. And that he was the sort of man who could earn it. Again, a sharp contrast to the children who had no concept of earning anything and just, without even knowing it, trusted in the lavish grace of God. This man had a fundamental misunderstanding of what it was to be reconciled to God and of what it means to be good. We see that in verse 17. Jesus keys in on one word in his question. The man had asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus responds, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus is any less good than God the Father. The one he's referring to is God the Father. He's not saying that he's less good than God the Father. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in one God, eternally existent in three persons. Okay, one one essence, three persons. So God the Father is absolutely good, and God the Son is absolutely good, and God the Holy Spirit is absolutely good. But this man has no idea who Jesus is. He doesn't know that Jesus is God. He just knows that Jesus is is some sort of prophet, some guy who has a following, some guy who, who seems to be pretty legit, and he's got questions and he wants to ask. So Jesus, recognizing that this guy is not addressing him as God, says, why in the world would you even ask me what's good? What do we as mere men know about goodness? He says, when you talk about goodness, I think you're grading on a curve. And and I want to lift your eyes a little bit that you might see the goodness of God. And you might realize that whatever goodness you bring to the table, it's not the goodness of God. It's woefully inadequate. But Jesus plays along. He says, if you want to enter life, Obey the commandments. In in other words, follow the law that God has given. Because God gave the law not to save, but to reveal his character, to point the way to him, to point to a need for a savior. The, the, The law, the law had high demands. The law was absolutely crushing. It revealed God's character, and at the same time, it revealed our inadequacy. It pointed us to the need for substitutionary atonement. You go throughout the law of God, and you see animal sacrifice. You see people sinning, and and, and in response to their sin, they take an animal, and they bring this animal, and they lay their their hand on the head of the animal. And then they slit the throat of the animal. They say, in effect, my sin is on your head. And then the one who bears their sin dies. The whole of the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus. He said, if you want to have life, Start walking down this path that God gave you that's ultimately going to lead you back to me. If if, if you want to have life, obey the commandments. His response, verse 18, which ones? The man inquired, because this guy was serious. He'd, He'd actually read the first five books of the Bible, and he knew that there were a lot of commandments. 616, something like that. I don't know the exact number, but this guy did. He, he knew that that was daunting. And some people read this and they, they feel like he's asking, well, what's the minimum requirement? What's, what's the least that I have to do to make God happy? And, and, and that's, that's kind of a tempting understanding, right? Because I think sometimes we do that. And when I read that this a couple of weeks ago as I began studying and preparing for the sermon, that was my initial take. Like, what's the minimum requirement? But the more I studied this, the more I wrestled with this, the more I looked at the context clues of what's going on in this guy's life, I don't think he was out for a minimum requirement. I think this man was sincere. 
I think he really wanted to know what would it look like to please God, to know God, to follow God. And I think because he was, he was, he was seeking after God and because the journey had been hard, I think he also had a, a question kind of nagging me in the back of the mind saying, okay, well, well when is enough going to be enough? When can I get off this religious treadmill? When can I take a break? When can I rest? When can I have some assurance, some confidence, some hope that God is ultimately satisfied and that I don't have to do more? Either way, this man asked for a list. So Jesus goes to the original list. And Jesus quotes five of the Ten Commandments, kind of this, this summary uh, this, this summary statement of God's law. And then likewise, he tosses in one more summary statement out of Leviticus 19. Uh, Jesus replied, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. In other words, don't lie. Um, honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we don't emphasize the Ten Commandments all that much. I'm, I'm guessing most of us can't list them off by memory. Um, these guys did. In his day, if he's a religious leader, he knew this list. He knew it backward and forward. He, could, he knew it better than you and I know our ABCs. And so it was also probably really obvious to this guy what was missing from the list. So he gave five out of ten, and he, 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 it's kind of weird the ones that he chose. He skipped the first four. Within the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments are, are Godward, and the, and the next six are manward. Okay, that's manward, I don't know, whatever. Maybe we don't talk that way, but theologians do. Um, the, 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 the first four talk about how we relate to God, that, that we would love God more than anything. That, that nothing would compete with God for our affections, for our love, for our trust, for our hope, for our longings. That, that God would be the supreme object of our affections. That's really what the first four commands are getting at. And, and when he read off the list of commandments, Jesus skipped all four. Really weird. And, and, and then he, he, he goes into some of these commandments about how we relate to each other, starting with murder. Don't murder people. Don't kill people. That's kind of obvious. But he gets through five out of six, but the one that he skips, the, the last one, is you shall not covet. Which, again, that's, that's kind of like an old-fashioned way of saying that. I wonder if... Um, if maybe the translations leave it the way it is so it's not quite so convicting because we don't actually know what covet means. Uh, but, but covet means like, stop longing for other people's stuff. Stop looking at, 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 the, at the new Xbox game that your neighbor has and saying, oh, my life would be great if I had that. Stop noticing the shoes that your friends are wearing and, and saying, oh, if I had that, life would be great. When, when you go out for the, for the team, stop competing. Stop, stop saying, oh, I, I deserve a better spot. I, I wish that I had that spot. Stop watching commercials, okay? Because our society, we have this whole industry. I think we call it marketing, but, but you're, you're kind of getting a covenant degree. No offense to you guys who are in marketing. Maybe you can use it for the glory of God. That'd be amazing. But we have this whole vast industry that's, the whole purpose of it is to sow discontent within your heart, to say you don't have quite enough, but if you had our thing, then you'd really be happy. You know, what, what, what you desperately need is, is, is a bigger house or a newer car. Maybe, maybe one of those with, is, is it Toyota that, 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 that has like the, the red ribbons on it during the holiday commercials? I, I don't know what it is, but what, what do we got, Lexus? Lexus, Lexus. So give, give me the lines, like experience amazing, is that now? I don't know, whatever. We, 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 we can go after it. This isn't a Lexus commercial. Ford guys, we got you too. We're good. Um... Again, we just have this whole industry that's all about sowing discontent in our hearts and saying, man, you need this one more thing. You'd think when he's talking to a rich man that if he was going to emphasize any command, he might say, you know, don't covet. Stop stockpiling. Stop seeking more stuff. Stop pursuing wealth as, 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 as a means to satisfaction, as a means to joy, as, as, as a means to security. Okay? Stop it. And yet Jesus doesn't go after this, this most obvious of all commands to bring to a rich man. 
He, he doesn't confront him about the fact that, that, that God really isn't first in his life, and he doesn't confront him about his relationship with possessions. He just starts tossing him softballs. Hey, how about, how about this? You, you want to inherit life? You want to be saved? You want to be reconciled to God? Don't kill people. And the guy's like, check. All right, this is, this is great. And, 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 and don't steal. Check. Well, mostly check. And, 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 and don't commit adultery. Yeah, nailed that one. Nailed that one. Okay? He, he didn't get at the hard issues, at least not to begin with. But here's the... Here's the thing about Jesus' teaching. We've seen this in the Sermon on the Mount. That we've, we see this throughout the New Testament. We see this reality that the, the, the commands were, were always more than commands. Um, it, was, it was never as simple as obeying the letter of the law. But rather, God was always chasing after our hearts. Jesus was always angling to the heart beneath obedience. I'll, I'll read you a couple excerpts from the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll see this clearly. Jesus says in Matthew 5, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Okay, and like everyone agrees, that's, that's bad news. That's, that's not good for anybody. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Anyone who looks at a man lustfully has, all, has already committed adultery with him in his or her heart. He's, he's, he's trying to get to the sin beneath the sin, the, the heart beneath the action. Likewise, regarding murder, he says, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You see the escalation here? This, this is getting kind of serious because I, I look at murder and I'm like, yeah, bad people over there. Jesus looks at the attitude between brothers and sisters, between siblings, between, be, between any of us in this room. He says, bad people over here. Okay? He says, this is serious. This is sin. When you get on the highway today and somebody cuts you off and, and your impulse is, you fool, you idiot, you, how can you inconvenience me like this? What you're saying in your heart is, man, my life would be better if you weren't a part of it. My life would be better if you were dead and I could just pull out onto the road and, and, and make my right turn and my left turn wherever I please because you're not in my way. He says that's wicked says it's the same impulse that, that leads to murder that is in your heart. That says, I am so important and my desires are so important and these other people are in my way. Again, Matthew chapter 5, verse, verse 43, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The first part of that's in, in the scriptures. The second part, they just kind of made up. Yeah, love your neighbor, but, but we can hate our enemies, right? But Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, because that's the way that God our Father loves. In other words, obeying God's law was always about more than simply keeping the letter of the law. God is always going after our hearts. But all this man is looking at is outward obedience, and Jesus knows it. So he shares half a list, the more outward, objective, clear-cut commandments. And then Jesus slides in this one familiar command that's just a little bit harder to measure, adding it as though it's, it's just a simple thing, saying, oh, oh and, and also, love your neighbor as yourself. But this man, he just kind of glosses over the whole thing, and without hesitation, he replies, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? So in the same breath, we, we hear this profoundly proud statement and a desperately humble statement. It, it's proud because, because this man actually believes that he's kept these things. He, 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 he believes in his own self-sufficiency. He's, he's foolish enough to imagine that he could ever earn God's favor. We see immense pride. And yet we also see humility. 
Because as much as this man is struggling and striving and working to earn God's favor and saying all these things I have kept, we still see this humility and sincerity beneath it. Because somewhere inside this man, beneath all the performance and effort, was this nagging suspicion that even his best might still not be good enough. He says, I've kept all of these laws, but what do I still lack? So how does Jesus respond? I I told you, each of these versions of the story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they record the same story, but there's just different nuances, different aspects, different different angles that they pick up. So I want to jump into Mark's version for a minute and look at Jesus' reply in Mark's version of the story. Mark chapter 10, verse 21 says, Jesus looked at this man and he loved him. He looked at this man with eyes of compassion and grace. Now understand, Jesus is about to rebuke this man. But he's not rebuking him in anger. He's not trying to be hard on this guy. He's trying to be lovingly gracious and honest. He's just being real with this man about what's going on in his heart. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. He said, you're so close to coming into the kingdom of God. You are so close to eternal life. You're so close to being reconciled to God. But one thing you lack. I want you to picture yourself in the scene for a minute. I want you to imagine that you are the person who is coming to Jesus and asking Jesus, what is, what's, what's required of me to enter into life? What would you ask of me in order that I might be reconciled to you? What if Jesus responds to you and says, you are so close, but there's just this one thing that you lack. One thing, one area of your life that really needs to change. One idol that that, that you love that you need to let go of. Would you recognize that encounter for the gift that it is? Would you be eager to hear what's about to come out of the mouth of Jesus? Would you want to know what the one thing is that's keeping you from God so that you could be done with it, so that you could throw it away, so that you could turn away and run towards your Savior? Or would there be this this awful sinking feeling? that he's going to ask for the one thing that I truly love. That he's going to take away from me the one thing that I believe is good. Jesus was offering this man a gift. This was loving. To to have the insight and to be so honest as to say, this is the heart issue that you need to deal with in order that you might be reconciled to me in order that you might really worship the living God and find life in him. This was a privilege. This was a gift. Matthew's version, it states the same idea, just just slightly differently. In Mark, he says, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you lack. In Matthew's version, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, and when he says perfect, he's, he's not talking about some unattainable ideal. He's, he's, he's answering the man's question. What do I have to do to be saved? Jesus says, if, if you want to be perfect, uh, other ways of translating this word, if you want to be complete, if you want to be mature, bottom line, if you want to seek after God with undivided loyalty and a joyfully obedient heart, that's the question he's answering. If you want to follow God with an undivided heart, Here's what you need to do, guy. He says, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. I want you to understand where this guy's coming from. He longed to know God. He longed to walk with God, to reflect the righteousness of God and the character of God and the love of God in the way he engaged this world. This man loved the idea of walking with God. But he loved money more. He loved wealth more. 
Jesus gave this man a precious gift, the gift of honest, loving rebuke, but his heart was unwilling to receive it. Again, what about us? Do we want to be corrected? Do we want to be rebuked? Do we want to see the things in our heart that would draw our hearts away from God? And do we want to be done with them? Or do we just want to hold on to our idols and be left alone? For this man, his idol was money. Wealth and all that comes with it. Power and prestige and privilege, comfort, security, stability. Money can get you so many things. Money was the object that he trusted in and that he hoped in. And I'm sure the same could be said of many of us. I don't know if money is your idol or not, but try it on for size. If Jesus came to you and said, hey, here's the one thing I need you to do, to, to, to just kind of put some sin to death in your life and, and move on and really follow me. Here's, here's all I need you to do. Just, just go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Would that feel like a relief to you? Would it be a joy to you? Would it be, well, finally, I've been trying to figure out what it looks like to follow him, and now I know, take it. Or would that feel like death? I've been saving up for this house for years. I just got the bathroom painted the color that I like. You know, I, I just bought that car. You can have the degree. I still owe 80 grand on that thing, but No. Are we free with our money? If you've, been, if you've been seeking to follow Jesus for a while now, and yet you still find it hard to give regularly, to give generously, to, to give sacrificially, it's probably a really good indication that money is an idol in your life. Okay? Um, an idol is something that I love more than God, something that I trust in more than God, something that I hope in more than God. And as Americans, it's, it's probably true that among our other idols, for many of us, money is an idol, okay? Um, how, do, how do we know an idol? How do we know the right balance? Um, if, if, if I love God more than money, then I'm going to find great joy in using my money to serve God. If I love money more than God, then I'm going to be very reluctant to part with my money, even to give it for the glory of God, even to give it to advance his kingdom, because, I mean, money's in my hand, and I can trust it. I know what I can get with money. I don't know what I can get with God, okay? Maybe this is an idol in your life. As, as Americans, it, it probably is. It's something, something to look at. Um, probably not your only idol, probably not my only idol. For this, Jesus would say different things to different people. If, if Jesus were approaching a homeless man, he, he probably would not say, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor, then come follow me. Because that homeless man probably has a different idol. Okay, so maybe, maybe he would have said, um, surrender your freedom. A buddy of mine uh, led the Bowery Rescue Mission in New York City for years and years and years and years. He has decades of experience in homeless ministry. One of, one of his taglines that he'd say all the time is, nobody does freedom like the homeless. Nobody does freedom like the homeless. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> You're not the boss of me. I, I'm doing my own thing. Complete freedom. It's, it's like the American ideal pushed to the extreme. So if Jesus is coming to a homeless man, maybe he says, I, I want you to surrender your freedom. I want you to embrace authority. I want you to embrace responsibility. And come follow me. Um, to, to somebody who worships at the altar of career or academic success. Jesus may very well have said, quit your job. Drop out of school. Come follow me. How blasphemous is that in this town? How can you say that from the pulpit? That's just stupid. Okay? But if, but if that's your idol, if that's the thing that you love more than God then that's the thing that Jesus would go after. Yeah, quit your job. 
Drop out of school, whatever. Get your priorities straight. Maybe you go back to school someday, but follow Jesus first. For those who worship at the altar of relationship or sex or who are enslaved to sexual sin, Jesus would probably say, break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, then come and follow me. End the relationship that's enslaving you in sin, and then come and follow me. To those who seek to satisfy the same desires to por- through pornography, probably say, cut your cable subscription. Get rid of your internet service. Throw your iPhone in the Huron River and then come and follow me. It's a different demand that he's going to make on different people's lives based on what the idol is that enslaves them. To those of us who love our hobbies more than Jesus, you might say, sell your gaming system. Drop out of your sports team. Recycle your sewing machine or your knitting needles or or whatever it is that your hobby may be. Man, if you love this thing more than you love Jesus, get rid of it. Don't, don't, Don't hold it as your teddy bear that keeps you warm at night. No, burn it. Throw it away. Get it away from me. If this is keeping me from God, then I want it out of my life. That's the gift that Jesus was offering this man. Just some clarity. This is what's keeping you from God. Let me help you be done with it. I don't know what your idol is. I don't know what you run to for comfort. I don't know what you hope in for joy. I don't know what you trust in for security. I don't know what you grasp onto as the anchor of your identity. But if you're seeking any of that apart from Jesus, his call to you is simple. He says, come follow me. Come hope in me. Come trust in me. Come anchor your identity in me. Come find your joy in me. At the core of Jesus' call is a call to turn away from our pride and self-sufficiency, to abandon our false security and idolatry. To turn away from anything but him and to follow him. And I'm telling you, it is hard. And and it's really not as simple as you identify one idol and you put that to death and then it's like smooth sailing from there. This is like whack-a-mole. You you identify one idol, you put it to death, and another one pops up. Um, we a bunch of us were getting together a couple of weeks ago. We were looking at this passage. I didn't ask Kenny's send his permission, but you know, there you go. Um, wonderful insight that she has. She's like, it's it's like the boss battle in the video game. You know, like, like, I don't know what the new bosses are because I don't play the new video games, but old school Mario, okay? Super Mario Brothers, original Nintendo. You, you, you get to the end of that level and you beat Bowser. You're like, yeah, I beat Bowser. And then it's like World 2.1 or something. You just got to do it again and you got to beat Bowser again and again and again. And that's how it is with idols. And we keep on going after these idols and, and we keep on putting them to death until, until we get to the sin beneath the sin, which is our pride. And we come to the place that we acknowledge, I cannot win this battle in my own strength. I can't keep on putting my sins to death. I need God's grace. I need God's grace to save me. I need God's grace to work in me, both to will and to act, to change not just my behavior, but my desires. God, you need to work because I'm at my end. I cannot do this apart from you. He drives us to our knees that we might seek his grace, that we might know our need for him, that we might, that we might be like little children, not trying to build our resume, not trying to perform, not trying to impress God, not trying to impress anybody. Just saying, I got nothing, but right over here is, is a joyful, loving father who welcomes me to bounce on his lap to laugh and to cry, and I trust in him, and I hope in him, and I know that he's going to be gracious to me. I don't doubt it. Kids don't doubt the grace of their parents. That that, that, that three-year-old, they just keep on running to you. They keep on trusting you. It says that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's people who have realized just how good their God is, just how worthy of trust and faith and hope and allegiance their God is. And so he is the one 
that they run to again and again and again and again and again. God's just trying to get us to the place that we realize that, that we only ultimately find life in him and joy in him and peace in him and pleasure in him. And that the joys that we can have in him are better than anything that we can get from his creation. The creator is the gift. Jesus knew that this one thing that this young man lacked, and this this one thing that all of us ultimately lack, is an absolute, unconditional surrender to God. And so he says, come, follow me. Because the heart that loves God will follow his son. When we trust in Jesus as our Savior, we also embrace him as our Lord. Salvation is a free gift. We don't deserve it. We could never earn it. It's by grace through faith that Jesus takes our sin on his back and he destroys it on the cross. Likewise, it's by grace through faith that he clothes us with the righteousness of Jesus. That we might stand in the very presence of God without guilt or shame. Jesus saves us by grace through faith. But when he saves us, he also buys us. Okay? That's the language that Paul uses in in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He is our Savior and our Lord. In the words of Charles Spurgeon, he says, if you would have Christ's blood redeem you, you must give up to Christ yourself, your body, your soul, your spirit, your substance, your talents, your time, your all. You must from this day forward be Christ's servant, come what may. Jesus is our Lord and we joyfully surrender to him. That's what it means to come and follow him. The heart that is not surrendered is not saved. So when this young man asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The essence and the core of Jesus' answer is simply come and follow me. Surrendering his wealth was just one of a thousand surrenders that he would need to make again and again. It's it's not some momentary act of self-denial that saves us. Rather, it's the hope of finding life in Jesus instead of in our idol. It's the trust that Jesus is better, is more beautiful, is more satisfying, that causes us to joyfully surrender anything and everything to him. But again, surrendering is really hard. Verse 22. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Mm. It's not the worst possible reaction. At least he understood the stakes. He was sad because he realized that he was turning away from God in order to cling to his wealth. Okay? Some of us, we cling to our wealth, we cling to our idols, and we don't even realize that in the process we're turning away from God. We don't walk away sad because we weren't even listening. This man turned away sad. He saw his wealth as a blessing. But Jesus recognized that for this man, his wealth was a curse. He saw his wealth as an asset, but Jesus recognized it as a liability, an obstacle, a hindrance to his faith. So he called him to give it up, to throw it away. And whatever our idols are, he invites us to do the same, to be done with them. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard. This is really hard. I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because a rich man is so prone to independence, to self-reliance, and to pride. Again, a rich man tends to be the exact opposite of the little children who came with humble faith. 
They come humbly, they come joyfully, they come trusting in the love and grace of their king. But a proud man does not want grace. He wants the world to recognize that he's earned his honor and he believes that he deserves God's approval as well. That's why it's hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's hard for an Ann Arborite to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's hard for an American to enter the kingdom of heaven, amen? Because we are proud, we are self-reliant, we're rich. In this community, we're educated. We have all sorts of resources. What do I need a God for? And even if I thought I needed him, I need him to respect me. I need him to recognize that I've done good too. It's the response of a fool. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's easy. We don't have camels. We don't don't have elephants. What do we have? What are our big animals here? That was their big animal. We got some cows out in the country. It's easier for a cow to go through the charging port on your iPhone. Okay? Than for you or me to enter the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying? He's saying that apart from a miracle of God, this is impossible. Because we are simply too proud. We are too independent, we're too self-absorbed, we're we're, we're too distracted by all the good blessings of God in this creation to set our eyes on the Creator. He says, unless He miraculously intervenes, it's absolutely impossible for us to be reconciled to Him, to be humbled in that way. So what do we do? We pray that God would move miraculously. Man, that's what I'm doing every day praying for myself and praying for you, that God would miraculously move. I pray for many of you by name this week. Many of you who come to Mosaic Church and, and, and you love our church and you like the donuts and you like the people and, and it's great and you're welcome wherever you're at in this process. But some of you, you simply haven't decided if you trust in Jesus and you believe in Jesus and, and you want to surrender your life to him. And, and I just recognize that, that you getting over that hump, you, you coming to a place of faith, you coming to a place of surrender, it is impossible unless God moves. So I have been begging all week. I've been begging every week. I've been begging this morning. I'm begging now that God would move. That he'd help you to see your need and that he would help you to see his beauty. That you would recognize that what God offers you in himself is better than anything else that will ever be offered to you in your life. And that he wants to humble you. Not because it's hard, but because it's good. But because he can use a humble man. He can use a humble woman to bring joy into your own life and joy and blessing into the lives of others. When the disciples heard this, when they heard this this line about the the camel and the eye of the needle and the impossibility of anyone, of anyone coming to Christ, when they heard this, they were greatly astonished and they asked, who then can be saved? Who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So again, we pray that God would move. We pray that God would open the eyes of the blind. And when I refer to the eyes of the blind, I mean your blind eyes and mine. That God would open our eyes to see his beauty and our ugliness, to see his goodness and our wickedness, to see his love and our rejection of his love. We pray that God would open our eyes. And for those of us whose eyes have never been opened, we pray that even in this moment, God would open our eyes to see our desperate need for his grace. Let's pray. God, do that. God, I hate the reality of my own futility. I hate that there is nothing that I can humanly do in the lives of the people that I love to convince them or to persuade them or to help them to see the goodness of who you are and their desperate need for you. But God, I pray that you would do what we cannot do, that you would move for your glory, that you would move 
by your grace. I pray for those who have never surrendered their life to you, that they do so for the first time. I pray for those like me who, who follow after you and yet struggle and find our hearts ensnared by idols and, and find certain idols just so compelling that, that, that it feels like death to let them go. God, I pray that we would see sin for the death that it is. And that we wouldn't just let it go, we would fling it far from us. Lord, help us to see you, help us to hope in you, help us to trust in you. May we be the people who answer Jesus' call, come follow me. Amen.